Okay, so uh, workers. We were saying that the workers were more um, uh, were, were the beneficiaries of uh, the world wars, but I um, I want to emphasize that each country's experience is different. Okay, so um, uh, the workers had an advantage in Britain uh, before the First World War, but you can't argue the same for Germany uh, necessarily, because in Germany there was huge starvation and uh, issues related to health services, so the workers in, in Germany did not have as much access as uh, the workers in Britain did. So um, we're not generalizing. Uh, to all countries, but in uh, uh, general, uh, workers' situation during the wars were affected uh, in a more positive way than uh, other classes, okay, such as the white color uh, classes. Now, guys, I'm going to move from the working class to women. And um, this is actually quite interesting because uh, I would argue that the situation with women actually changed. Uh, all throughout uh, Europe, uh, in Britain and Germany and France, uh, all throughout Europe in quite a positive way uh, during the, the world wars, okay? I think I already uh, mentioned uh, the mentality. The men are gone. Most are dead. They're killed in the wars. So who do you have left? Now, you need to understand that women did not use to work before uh, the wars. Uh, before the Second World War, you still had a very limited uh, percentage of women uh, uh, in the, the workforce. But by First World War, in France, uh, women filled 400,000, almost 400,000 positions in the workforce. And interestingly, they did not only work in sectors that were accepted more feminine, such as the health sector, but also as, uh, in sectors such as metallurgy or vehicles, electronics, and um, transportation. So the sectors that uh, the, the women started working has changed as a result of, again, the, the shortage of, of men. Okay, so as you have fewer men um, left in the cities, you have women having to do a lot. Um, another interesting um, uh, thing is that, you know, there are two schools of thought about how wars, systemic wars, affected women. Now, the, the traditional school uh, says that war caused a permanent and a sudden change in women's um, uh, situation in the society. But the revisionist school, mostly the, the French uh, social historians, argue that after the wars, things go back to normal. So wars don't have such a huge impact on women's um, uh, rights uh, uh, in the world, in the system. Now, the, the traditional school is mostly the British, uh, British school, and the revisionist school is mostly the French uh, school. So having said that, if we look at um, what, what went on and how war affected women, and if you look at the numbers of working women after the wars come to an end, I think we will have a better idea of which school actually has more empirical uh, support for their arguments, okay? So when you look at um, uh, the widows and orphans, women, widows, and orphans, what do you think would happen to them during the wars? Well, that might be one uh, consequence, but who's going to abuse them? Don't forget that a uh, majority of the men are gone. Of course, the possibility is still there, and it, it did happen. The widows during the wars are actually in a more powerful state because the state uh, protects them because they become the new workforce. Now, something interesting. Before um, uh, the, the World Wars, women, the ones who worked 
And I, I want to say that only 8 9% of, of the population of the women could work anyways. And those who actually did work uh, would work before they got married because it was socially unacceptable to have your wife work at the time. There are still some people who would agree on that. I'm not saying anything about that. But at the time, I'm talking about before the First World War and especially before the Second World War, men believed that the women had to stop working as soon as they got married because it was unex un um, um, uh, unacceptable. What was the reasoning behind that? It would mean that the man was a breadwinner. Man was what? The man would not be a good breadwinner if he depended on his wife. And Men couldn't depend on the wife, yes. And women should raise the children, so... Women would raise the children, okay. Well, for a while though, women don't have to give birth because, you know, war times, uh, for a while, the men are gone. Most of the men are gone, especially in countries like Germany, right? And so the women have more free time. And also, you know, the women's uh, children are also at war. They're gone. They're sent off to war. And what else? Men must have been thinking or the society in general, and I'm talking about Europe, guys. I'm not talking about Turkey here. Because, you know, from the Turkish perspective, uh, we tend to believe that Europe was Europe at all times, you know. We ignore that Europe actually evolved uh, and European culture also evolved over time. So it might actually come, as, uh, come quite surprising to you that at the time, men and the society in general thought that working is an activity done to make money, not to fulfill your personal desires or not to satisfy your inner, uh, you know, struggles. Why do I work? I like to teach. That's one of the answers. Why, would I, why do I like to teach? If one student got something uh, out of what I'm saying in class, that would make me a better person. Very idealistic, isn't it? OK. True. So I'm talking about some kind of inner uh, satisfaction and some kind of uh, a desire to actually realize myself, right? So I'm, I haven't said anything about money yet, have I? Well, by the beginning of the 20th century, people would say, I work because I need to make money. And if I don't need to make money, if I'm extremely rich, I don't work. At this day and age, don't we have, you know, a Koch family, Sabanji family, and these uh, richer families who still work although they have a lot of money, right? Why do they still work to become richer? <laughs> they're rich, but they want to become richer. Exactly. So they're fulfilling themselves. They're fulfilling their own um, uh, goals. Their personal uh, achievements actually make them happy. Well, by the beginning of the, the 20th century, by the, by the, before First World War, that is not the mentality in the world. Guys, I want you to, to keep that in mind. At the time, the mentality is, if my wife doesn't need money because I, the man, am the provider of the house, of the household, then, you know, I'm not going to let my wife work. So that was the mentality. Yes? But if I get you right, you're saying that now, the majority of people work I'm not saying that uh, the majority of people are doing that. But a small of people. Absolutely. People who actually, um, well, actually, hold on. Hold on for a second. I have to work. I don't have a rich family. So, does that mean that I'm working, I'm not working for the money? I am working for the money. If I didn't work, I would starve. So primarily, 
So yes, money is, has become one of the motivations. But uh, I would argue that money is one of my motivations, but choosing this, this work uh, especially, was because that I wanted to uh, fulfill my personal desires. I could have made much more money if that was uh, the basic desire if I worked in a different sector. I mean, come on, in the education sector, you can never be rich, right, as a college professor. So I'm saying that the mentality has changed in the world, but especially in societies that are affected from the, the, uh, this, this uh, evolutionary process that the wars have led to, okay? How do you think that the Turkish society has changed? Well, because we have been looking at Europe and how Europe has evolved, and we have learned from Europe that it's actually a good thing that women works. So the culture, I think in my country, was affected by the culture of the, the European countries that went through this process by the beginning of uh, the 20th century, by, um, uh, before the First World War. Okay, so, but again, I want you to remember that Europe did not, did not suddenly become, you know, this uh, uh, place where human rights and democracy and women's uh, rights and workers' rights were all realized uh, for centuries. No, the, the wars, the systemic wars, such as the world wars, have uh, had a huge effect on uh, Europe. But once again, don't forget, I think I told you this before, that Europe had the chance to evolve for centuries, okay? So Europe doesn't evolve all of a sudden in, you know, 20 years or 50 years or 80 years. So remember that I told you that uh, the late industrializers were kind of unlucky because they had to industrialize faster and when you industrialize faster, the social uh, structure and social dynamics will have to evolve faster and when that happens there will be problems and issues because some of the values will not be um, uh, will not be uh, internalized as they would be in many centuries okay so if uh, and, and I, I had told you earlier that this might be the advantage of Europeans from that uh, perspective, because there was enough time to inter internalize the values. But once again, I would say that women's rights that I'm talking about um, are still in the process of being internalized in Europe as well. Exactly. Don't you think? Yeah, because the thing is that all the women who work, when the men came back, they were, they were expected to work, but they were also expected to do all the other stuff. Uh -huh. expected, so some would argue that they actually had a double burden now because they were expected to work and expected to raise children. Exactly. So you actually, you know, uh, yes, you're making money, but in the meantime, you're actually overloaded. And um, uh, let me, I, I will get back to this, but I'll, I'll tell you a couple more interesting things. Um, let me have my numbers with me. Okay, look. In Paris, during the First World War, 40%, 40% of the war uh, goods produced were produced by women. 40%, okay? Uh, in Britain, by 1943, a full 51% of women were actually working outside. Half the women were working outside by 1943. You are thinking, well, you can think two, in two ways about this. Only 50% in Britain, the oldest democracy? That might be the first, first way to think about this, right? But at the same time, I need you to understand that even in Britain by 1943 at war times, only half the women could work. And I'll tell you something sadder, Okay, in 1939, women in Britain held only 10% of the engineering jobs. That's sad. 
Well, at the time, even in a country like Britain, the oldest democracy, women were not <laughs> believed to be as smart or as capable as men were. Or because they had to watch for their kids at home, they could not spend all the, the hours that the engineers had to st uh, spend at work. Okay, but I'll, 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 in a moment, you're going to feel much better. Um, by 1950, five years after the war, 34%, well, actually, uh, during the war, that 10% became 34%. It got more than three times um, uh, during the war. And then something sad happened. War came to an end. Men who were lucky not to, to, to die, not to get killed in war, came back. And then they looked and they saw that the women that they left are no longer there. What do you think will happen then? Divorces. Oh, yeah. Divorce rates increased as a result. Because women, the men came back and they said, well, we want you to, to actually stay home now. You don't need to work anymore. See, that's the, the key word there. You don't need to work anymore. So the need to work is tied to financial needs. Okay? So the moment you say you don't need to work to the women who has been working for the last five, six years and who has actually bought everything that she wanted with the money that she herself made, divorce rates, of course, will uh, be affected. Okay? So another consequence is going to be then uh, uh, some women will give up their work, and they did. So remember that 10% in 1939 became 34%, and by 1950, it became 21, back to 21%. But here's the thing, guys. From 10% in uh, 10 years, the number still doubled and went to, to 21%. 21% is nothing compared to today. I understand. But imagine we're talking about 1950s. You watch Stepford Wives and all these uh, 1950s uh, movies, right? So it, at a time that women, uh, the, the individuality of women is really not a, a, a question even. 21%, uh, the increase from 10% to 21% is, is a consequence of the Second World War. Okay? So, how does that happen? Perceptions start changing. Okay? The widows and orphans of the wars no longer uh, feel as uh, weak as they did in the past. And also, don't forget that these people learned these new jobs, and they were trained now. So the bosses were happy that they, they, were, uh, they, they had women working in their factories. Let me tell you one more sad thing. Today is a sad day. Women were not getting paid as much as their husbands who were fighting and dying in war uh, were getting paid. But still, they were getting paid. Now, imagine this from the factory owner's perspective. Women are working. They're actually more durable. And uh, they actually don't ask for as much money. So you're, you're paying them uh, less money. And in the meantime, they're working at the factory, and they're working at home, and they're not complaining. So the women actually are uh, it's quite advantageous to have the women work in your factory from that perspective. But when, when, uh, when uh, men come back, then that's going to be an issue. But once the perceptions are changed, and once you have the rights that you do, you never want to give them up. So the, the problem then that has become a problem uh, throughout Europe is once women understand that they are uh, good enough 
or as good enough as men were in these jobs that they were working at, mostly factory jobs uh, and other manly masculine jobs such as engineering, then they did not want to give up those jobs. And as a result, actually, uh, after 1950, you're going to see the rise of uh, a, a feminist, woman, uh, feminist women's movement in Europe, in several different parts of Europe. Okay? So I want you to consider this. Workers' rights and workers' movements have started or were triggered by uh, these wars, the, the great wars. And women's rights and women's movements were also triggered by uh, these wars. But for some reason, workers' rights uh, developed earlier and easier than women's rights. Well, you, the uh, answer, and why? The answer might be that, well, most of the, the workers' movements were led by men, and it was easier for uh, men to actually have, uh, install workers' rights. That might be uh, one of the answers. But interesting, because um, once you uh, have your self-perceptions change, everything changes. Like you said, Radun, I, I don't know if that was good or bad for women because now they're overloaded and uh, there are so many people who are depressed and who are living on pills so that they can actually uh, do everything all at once, you know, work at home and work uh, outside. But uh, that's, you know, that's your own subjective, uh, subjective decision to make for yourselves. What? We understand from this uh, uh, topic is wars have had unintended consequences, not only for the workers, but also for the women. Okay? Um, I think I already mentioned uh, suffrage before in, in general, but for women, in women's uh, suffrage voting rights, wars again were very important. Um, again, a couple. Um, Couple numbers. I don't have couple numbers. I thought I did. I have nice numbers for divorces. <laughs> so I thought that was more interesting. Okay. Um, the number of divorces in England jumps from 15,000 in nine, uh, to 58,000. Five times, so that's almost, uh, so that's a lot actually. Yes, um, let me see if I, if I have other numbers that I want to share. Okay, yes, uh, so the suffrage, I don't have the suffrage numbers. I think I gave you uh, some numbers for suffrage uh, uh, last week. So women will be voting as a result of going out, getting into the workforce, because what did I say? When you're in the workforce, you suddenly become a citizen. You suddenly become a person to be taxed. Okay? Like I said, you never thought taxation is so important in your life before, right? But after this course, you will understand why it's so important. If you are taxed, you actually become a, an individual, a citizen, in the eyes of the government, in the eyes of the state. Because being taxed, in return, will give you the right to say, I want to have a say in the political decisions that you make. In other words, women, after the First and Second World War, will start uh, being in the political uh, domain, and they will start be, uh, not only voting, but also participating as uh, political actors. Okay? And then after a while, there will be a race to have uh, women uh, in, in political parties. And for the longest time, women will not actually take uh, important posts, important political posts, because uh, the feminist movement will not affect uh, the, the women's status uh, until much later. Okay? An interesting work by a friend of mine. She looks at, if you're interested, she looks at the world and how, how many women have actually been 
uh, in important political posts such as prime ministry or presidency in the world, for the whole world. Um, so you might want to check that out. Any questions? Anything that, that um, is un unanswered? <coughs> yes. Uh, yes, you would find it in Marvik. Yeah, and there are others too. There are competing ideas, guys, because some scholars will argue that inflation is bad for everyone, but but some scholars like him will argue that at war times, for this specific class in countries such as Britain, inflation can actually be beneficial. But uh, uh, to me personally, the argument that um, you know. You become, you, you are in a position that you are valuable and you can actually bargain, negotiate your own wage. So to me, it makes sense that the workers will be more beneficial at uh, times of war. Yeah. Does this come okay with what you would, that Marxist question you have? Like, uh, would, you, would you say that the Marxist perspective may be that the proletariat uh, moves away from the national speed because uh, working conditions raise mm -hmm. and that same production and labor force, as you said, goes to other countries like China. Mm -hmm. So then that same group goes to another country and becomes a global proletariat. Um, and how, what would that lead to in the so end? Essentially, that, that traditional proletariat is, is still there. Mm -hmm. You may not see it within Europe but it's, it's just uh, transferring to another country. And so I think um, uh, neo-Marxists would look at the proletariat in terms of the global capitalist economy True. as opposed to the national economy. True. So there's just a transfer of, of that. Yes. Position. Would that delay the revolution, though, the proletariat? Yes, within the nation, okay. because it becomes globalized. Okay. Uh, and so within the nation, things are, um, you know, people are sedated, things are better off overall, but that same degree of oppression and exploitation occurs just outside of the nation. Transferred to another... In a place yeah. where they can't affect change to the people who are oppressing them. I would actually say that that would be a good answer. Yeah. That, that would be one of the answers. Or, uh, well, actually, let me, let me have you think about it and then we will discuss it in the review session. Okay? Okay. If uh, we're all okay with the the consequences of systemic wars on um, the society, the uh, women and workers. Now I am. Just a quick point. Yeah. Everything we're looking at, we, we also examined uh, in the law because there's something called the state of exception in the law, and especially in common law cases, you see during war times, uh, constitutional powers, usually the defense power, is interpreted more broadly, so for governments to do all these things they're doing, they usually don't have the power under the constitution, but they're given greater power because, they, because it's linked back to the defense power of, of most constitutions, especially mm -hmm. common law constitutions, and therefore they can legislate on things that they previously could uh, not. Never had a, uh, an That's true. To That's true. Um, I would say, like I said, I mean, wars are problematic, they are uh, destructive, they lead to several horrible things uh, in international relations and, and uh, uh, in people's lives, but at the same time, there are things that you couldn't do before that you can during the wars. And it gets justified in the war somehow. Absolutely. They say there's a wax and wane, so it waxes during the war time, mm -hmm. or it kind of expands the power, and then, and then it, it gradually, but it doesn't, it's not an instant stop of power after war. There, Governments usually have more power after a war, but there's a gradual process of limiting. And um, just like in the women's, uh, w women's situation during the war, during the war, you know, there will be a huge increase in rights. And then after the war, it will go back just a little bit. But what matters is you're never back to uh, the, the levels uh, before the war started. Okay, so there is some gain by the end of the, the war for all these, uh, for all these um, uh, different groups, for workers as well. If your wages have increased, 
you know, that is an advantage during the war, but you will never go back to uh, that uh, worst situation before that you experienced be, uh, before war. Don't forget that unions, the establishing uh, of unions actually affected uh, the worker situation afterwards. Okay, syndicates, unions. Now, I'll move on to, to uh, the minorities. Now, okay, you know, workers are affected, women uh, as a different group are affected, uh, minorities are also affected, and I have uh, interesting, actually, uh, things from the First World War. The minorities uh, usually, well, wars usually uh, destroys after a while, after a long while, uh, the, the war will destroy social cohesion. And especially in the case of empires, it will shatter an uh, empire. And this is exactly what happens uh, in First World War, okay? World War I is a good example that empires afterwards, such as uh, Austria-Hungary and Ottoman Empire, shattered. And one reason for that is how wars affect uh, minorities. We've said that empires are multi, uh, uh, are uh, heterogeneous, and they are multi-ethnic, and there are several different uh, groups of people uh, that uh, share different um, uh, ethnicities or religions or race or, or uh, language, whatever. What we know about empires for sure is that they are quite heterogeneous and that actually is quite a disadvantage because it's difficult to, uh, to control all these populations all the time, okay? So my example was when I sent troops to you to control you, I have to send troops to you too and that as a state puts me on um, a difficult situation. Now, Austria-Hungary uh, Empire, I have a couple of examples that you, you might be interested in. Um, in Austria-Hungary uh, Empire, during the war, during the, the front lines of the war, the Russians actually captured and tried to capture Czechs. Czechs were a part of Austria-Hungary uh, before, uh, before the, the First World War, and the Russians actually um, uh, try to capture Czechs uh, alive so that they would rearm the Czechs and then put them in the front lines. And usually what the Austrian-Hungarian uh, generals, and it was uh, usually the general would be from German ethnicity, and the Czechs would, would usually be used in the front line so that, you know, because they're not as elite as the, the Germans uh, in, within the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. If, you know, people will die in the front lines, and they would, it would be the Czechs that would uh, be used. And that is actually, I mean, it sounds bad, but um, in the meantime, this is kind of like using young people, you know, in the front lines because they're less uh, experienced. And in this case, the social elite, the German social elite, uh, during the war believes that these Czech uh, peasants are not, uh, uh, they do not know how to fight, and if they, there's one spot that they will be um, useful, it will be the front lines. But one thing that they could not calculate was that the Russians would capture the Czechs and then rearm them and then put them in the front lines of the Russians and then the, the Czechs in the front lines of the Austrian-Hungarians and the Czechs in the uh, front lines of the Russians would actually talk to each other, would yell at each other during the, the battle, and so they would not actually shoot at one another. And they would actually, um, uh, uh, they would actually communicate at wars. Well, this is interesting because it shows us that wars will have um, a, a um, um, 
Well, if, if especially if it if, uh, took a while and uh, the threat is not as imminent as it was, uh, wars will, will definitely affect social cohesion, but the minorities especially will be more affected by um, uh, what happens in the war and how the war uh, is, is destroying the, the empire. So the empires will disintegrate faster when minorities are uh, find out that uh, they actually are being used as, um, uh, as in the case of the Czechs in Austria-Hungary. Okay, so that's actually one uh, one thing that actually uh, led to the decline, the situation of the Czechs and other minorities during the First uh, World War, actually led to the decline of Austria-Hungary, okay, of the empire. But I'm going to to uh, give you another example, as interesting example, uh, and that is the African Americans uh, and the World Wars. African Americans in the US actually are, are uh, uh, conscribed and they go to war and they actually, um, uh, they're part, an active part of the war, not only the World Wars, but also later the Vietnam War they will be uh, fighting actively, and that is going to lead to a very unintended consequence for the United States because there will be mass migration of the South, from the South to the North of the country and to the West. Before that, before the World Wars, uh, the Blacks were living mostly in the South uh, regions of the country. But after the, the wars, they start moving, they start migrating, because wars actually lead to the legitimization of uh, the, the minority identity or the, the racial uh, segregation of the blacks were affected as a result of these wars. So in the first one, in the first example, I'm telling you that you know, the war actually led to an uprising among the, the Czechs and it led to the decline of the empire. And in the second example, I'm telling you that the racial, uh, uh, ra racist policies or racist perceptions of people have changed as a result. Well, I'm not saying that they, they completely uh, evaporated. I'm saying that they changed as a result of the, the world wars, okay? And one uh, reason for that might be what? Why would people think differently about a different race as a result of wars? They were one of us and they fight with us. Okay. So my son died, and next door, the son of a minority also died, and they died for the same cause. That actually adds to social cohesion, okay, in the country. So wars, on the one hand, can actually lead to uh, less social cohesion, yes, as in the case of minorities, uh, Czechs and Austria-Hungary. But in the meantime, wars can lead to an understanding between the minorities and the majority. So you would see that uh, the, the uh, rights of the African Americans in the US will develop after the world wars. I'm not saying as the only result of world wars, but the world wars actually help the, the uh, rights movement, the, the black movement uh, of the African Americans in um, the, the United States, okay? All right, ethnic redistribution in uh, Soviet Union. So uh, in Soviet Union, um, War actually is used as uh, a, a Russification of minorities, uh, as a strategy to Russification of minorities. So, uh, as you know, Soviet Union uh, was uh, built by different republics with different ethnicities, different people, different religions and, and uh, races. So it was quite difficult to keep the, uh, the, the Soviet Union intact. But uh, during the World War II, uh, the war contributed 
to the social cohesion of uh, the union. And also, not only social cohesion, but also the cohesion of ideology. How is that possible? How can I increase cohesion here, in my Soviet Union here? How can I do that? Hmm? Propaganda? What would I say to you? Let's just, you know, uh, assume that you're from a different race than you, uh, and you're from a different ethnicity, and your religion is different. So how do I actually use propaganda? Communist propaganda, that is, right? What can I say? Think again from the Marxist, neo-Marxist perspective. Okay. So All right. So the, the imperialists or uh, the racists like Hitler um, is attacking us. And as a result, if you want to protect your ideology, then you need to help me. You need to fight. You need to be in the front lines. If necessary, all of you will die. Okay? Until every one of the soldiers drop dead. I can come up with all, all uh, sorts of propaganda to get you to, to uh, fight. So um, most of the time then, the wars will lead to decrease in um, uh, differences of identity, or not decrease in differences of identity, but perceptions. Okay? So you're going to start perceiving that, you know, Whoever you're fighting with, together with, uh, although the, he or she is from a different identity, it's still, you know, you're still fighting for the same cause, which is going to increase uh, cohesion in the state. And that actually goes, is, uh, is um, uh, portrayed in these three examples. So once again, the effect of the consequence, unintended consequences of war can be bad, uh, for uh, the minority, because the minority can be used, as in the example of the Czechs, the minority can be used uh, as, you know, guinea pigs or as the frontline fighters that are sacrificed first. Uh, but in the meantime, as in the case of the, the um, uh, African Americans in the United States, the, uh, um, the war can lead to an understanding and also to migration. One thing, I will get to this later in nationalism, but how does migration affect the status of a minority? Why, is, do you think, why do you think migration is important? The fact that the African Americans started migrating from the South to the North and West. They're what? Okay, so if you are isolated to a region, to the south, and if you, you know, if the northerners or the westerners don't know you, they haven't lived with you, that might actually be, lead to more integration or assimilation of the population, okay, in other areas. That's one consequence. Is there a possibility that just the opposite will happen? What if, you know, migration led to uh, no integration at all and more hostility? That's possible too, right? So with mass migration, if you had prejudices, your prejudices can actually be strengthened as well. So migration can go both ways too. In nothing that I'm telling you in this course, there's one, you know, truth. You always have to consider both sides of the coin, guys, okay? So migration might have helped the African Americans uh, because they are, now they are uh, populated uh, in several different places in the, the US, and that actually changes the politics of the country. Usually African Americans uh, vote for the Democrat Party and um, the, the whites uh, vote for the Republican Party, conservative whites. Um, 
And as a result of the geographic uh, changes, the migration of blacks, the whole political structure of the country changes as well. Okay? And as a result, political rivalries will change. Maybe that, will, that alienated the, uh, uh, the, the African Americans uh, uh, more from the rest of the population. Okay? There are arguments for that as well. What we are arguing here is war can have both uh, uh, kinds of effects on the minorities. But we know for a fact that things have changed and changed in irreversible ways. Okay, for the workers, for the um, uh, uh, women, and for also the um, uh, minorities. Any questions? Okay, think about these issues. I want you to read uh, ideology, start reading ideology. Vanna Vera will be the next reading for uh, next week, and it will be included in the midterm. I will be putting um, a review sheet online at Moodle. Okay, thank you.